psychiatric medication and a medication used for a somatic condition or indeed another psychiatric condition can hugely impact care. So we need to be thinking always about pharmacokinetic interactions, pharmacodynamic interactions, looking at are there interactions at the level of the cytochrome P450 enzymes. For example, many antidepressants are strong inhibitors of the cytochrome P450 system at different isoenzymes, for example, fluoxetine, peroxetine, and fluvoxamine. And so sometimes we need to be monitoring drug concentrations because of these interactions. And in fact, this is mentioned by relevant guidelines, such as the Canadian and the Australian New Zealand guidelines. Let me end with a thought about anxiety, which we'll elaborate later on in the webinar. So this large systematic review and metasynthesis looked at what happens when a patient has comorbid anxiety with depression. We know these tend to be challenging patients. And in May 2013, when the American Psychiatric Association published the DSM-5, there was a new specifier added called depression with anxious distress. So this signifies that there is a large proportion of patients that have anxiety with their depression, depression, let alone patients who have generalized anxiety disorder or other anxiety disorders with their depression. In this large metasynthesis and systematic review, you can see that the odds ratio of relapse and recurrence of depression is much higher in patients who have GAD, generalized anxiety disorder, or a specific phobia. So this is something very important to note with our patients and to treat with our patients, making sure that we treat both the depression and anxiety at the same time. With that, I'd like to come back to my colleagues, Dr. Susanna Almeida and Dr. Zahinur Ismail for a discussion. Uh, and let me start, if I can, with Dr. Almeida. Uh, and uh, I'd like to ask you what I presented here about somatic and psychiatric disorders. Is this something you commonly see in your practice? And what are some of the common comorbidities you see reflected in your day-to-day -day practice? Thank you so much for the question. It's quite important because most times we actually see patients with comorbidities. Um, I would say that significantly uh, we will be seeing patients with GAD or around the anxious spectrum, but also as we go along and the more severe course of depression brings along the likelihood of relapse and having another acquired morbidities. For example, I see many patients with cancer, but also cardiovascular diseases, neuropsychiatric disorders, and quite constantly the ones related with metabolic syndrome. Those are quite common. I would say most, most common. Yeah, and I think uh, that reflects my practice as well. Dr. Ismail, uh, would you like to add anything about the management of some of the common comorbidities you see? And how do you choose on management strategies? Well, I think um, the initial stage is just to really assess and measure the comorbidities really well. And whether it be in the neurology clinic or in the psychiatry clinic, I would agree that the most common comorbidity is anxiety. And disentangling that from depression is sometimes hard, um, but it certainly complicates the treatment of depression because when there is comorbid anxiety, it's harder for people to really tolerate meds, to get up to the appropriate dose. They, they have more uh, side effects and, and, and less stability. So it, it's a, a really substantial comorbidity that needs to be addressed. Um, I, I completely agree, and just a reminder to our audience, please submit your Q&A uh, because we will be answering some questions. Let me come back to Dr. Almeida and Dr. Ismail. Let me ask you the same question, and maybe I'll take a stab at it as well. I mentioned health-seeking behavior, whether it's for depression or for a somatic comorbidity. And uh, one of the things I've seen is that even when I worked in internal medicine or surgery when I was rotating as an intern, that patients who have mental health conditions, especially depression, tend to come late 
people present with psychiatric uh, symptoms or psychiatric syndromes that may mask underlying comorbid neurological disease, which may not be addressed because the, the psychiatric symptoms take away from that holistic view of the person and getting care uh, for, their, for their mental and physical health. That's a great answer. I think one of the things um, I often think about when I have patients with complex comorbid conditions, whether they have a number of different psychiatric disorders or somatic disorders, especially older patients, which we'll, you know, we'll talk about that topic in a second, is the drug-drug interactions. I mean, it's, it's really difficult to uh, manage that. Um, again, a question for both of you, and maybe let me start with Dr. Ismail. How do you think about that in a busy day-to-day -day practice, and how do you uh, make sure that we're managing patients correctly and not missing anything when it comes to these important interactions? Right. In older adults, polypharmacy is more common than in younger people, and the risk of especially pharmacokinetic drug interactions is quite high. Um, I try to know the basic inducers and inhibitors of the major cytochrome P450 isoenzyme pathways and then and know the major culprits you know some agents um, will cause inhibition across multiple uh, CYP 450 isoenzymes like fluoxetine for example and so I keep my eye out for those red flag drugs and other ones with a narrow therapeutic window that if if drug levels raise then there can be trouble and so it's it's about being really vigilant to the number of medications they're on but the specifics of the medications as well that's great. Uh, Dr. Amelita, anything to add? And then maybe after that, we'll take a few questions from the audience. Yeah, I just would say that particularly in this group of patients who have, are dealing with uh, psychiatric and somatic illnesses uh, along with each other, perhaps also toxicity has to be taken care of. And the burden on liver and mm -hmm. kidneys also is quite important to watch out. Yeah. You know, one of the things I like to use is technological tools, right? So as Dr. Ismail said, uh, it's important to, with time, uh, have a decent memory of some of the major culprits. Um, so uh, having a drug guide, especially on a smartphone or a tablet or on your PC, looking for interactions is helpful. And I often do it when patients have multiple uh, medications. I don't shy away from even checking with the patient there. Uh, I think it makes them more at ease. The other thing I think in our profession is to try and choose a medication for depression that has very minimal interactions. Uh, and thankfully, there are several medications that fulfill those criteria. Um, we'll see if we have any questions from the audience. Um, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the meantime, um, one of the things I want to note and uh, to ask you about while we see some questions pop up is uh, the issue of stigma. And, and stigma exists across the world. Uh, do you have any comments, uh, Dr. Ismail, on, on battling stigma and overcoming that barrier to seeking care? Right. In the older generation, I think that stigma is greater because discussion of health um, hasn't been normalized the way it has in younger generations. So one has to go about it in a way that is aware of people's age and background, but also in a way that promotes their health and integration, again, of their, their mental and physical health, uh, allowing for, for them to get the best care. Right. And I think, you know, battling stigma starts with a societal level conversation. With that, let me move to some Q&A from the audience. So we have a great question here. Um, the clinician is asking, I have patients with comorbid conditions that have symptoms similar to major depressive disorder. What do you do when comorbid, comorbid conditions mask MDD symptoms? What strategies do you use to differentiate these symptoms from, you know, I guess what they're asking is, how do I know it's major depressive disorder or it's a comorbid uh, illness that's mimicking major depressive disorder or it's being masked? So let me start with Dr. Elmeade. What do you think? That's an important question, of course, and that's quite common. Particularly, uh, I work in a cancer uh, setting, and sometimes I find it quite helpful to ask backstreet, so worthlessness, helplessness, and hopelessness, the psychological mainstays of depression, and if they are a positive answer, then I will uh, go further on inv investigating the possibility of major depressive disorder. But the psychological questions and the backstreet, I think, are quite helpful. Yeah. 
You know, I think one of the things that's also helpful is to have uh, a panel of laboratory data to actually see. I think sometimes, uh, you know, uh, clinicians and patients forget that uh, in psychiatry we are trained in, uh, as MDs, and so uh, this is a, a common perception of psychiatry. So having a lab panel helps a lot. Let me um, direct a question to Dr. Ismail. Uh, the clinician here is asking, what is the percentage of depressive episodes without an amount of anxiety measured in a dimensional way? and without GAD, so, uh, you know, without specific phobia. So basically, in your practice, how often do you see depression without anxiety? Disentangling uh, depression and anxiety comes really from taking a good history and understanding the natural history. So, and, and this is a, it starts from, from childhood. So I, I try to first track or determine what is the primary condition. Now, often it's, it's, it's major depression. And then determine the overlay of anxiety. Did those anxiety symptoms come after? Was there a, you know, an underlay of anxiety throughout their whole life? Perhaps an obsessive compulsive personality style, perfectionistic temperament, those sorts of things. And then, um, so in addition to asking which one came first, I also ask which is the, the, the bigger problem for them. And that helps me then target um, you know, my, my treatment towards, towards anxiety or depression um, and, and understanding what is, what is really driving the, the, the dysfunction. And, and whether it's generalized anxiety disorder or anxious distress or comorbid phobias, et cetera, it, it becomes more vague because um, those comorbid anxiety syndromes are, are less well-defined than major depression, but nonetheless, when there is comorbidity, m my rule of thumb is that I start at the lowest dose possible because they tend to have more side effects. But I know that I need to probably go to a higher dose than I might um, with a, uh, an uncomplicated major depression. So the classic approach of start low and go slow and aim high. Exactly. All right. So with that, we'll conclude this section of the Q&A. Again, I encourage our audience members to submit your questions throughout the webinar. We will be answering some more questions later. But at this point, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Susanna Almeida, who will speak about some important somatic comorbidities in the management of MDD. Susanna? Thank you ever so much for the introduction and I appreciate being here with you and having your attention for such an important issue and such fresh data to share with you. Particularly, I, I would like to thank Lundbeck the opportunity to be amongst such a nice faculty. So, our learning objectives uh, for this first part will be to discuss the prevalence and additional burden of com common somatic comorbidities. I will take a closer look to some of them and review the treatment considerations for patients who have both MDD and comorbid somatic conditions. Furthermore, we will examine the available treatment options and explore them, including vortioxetine for patients with MDD and somatic comorbidities. And uh, we know that there are uh, many somatic conditions, a wide range of them are comorbid MDD. As after all, Swaydan was just saying, the more we live, the more we are being diagnosed with somatic illnesses that fortunately these days are being taken care of by a vast um, knowledge of medical new treatments that need so, somehow to be uh, taken for quite a long time along with the treatment of major depressive disorder. So I guess it's the cost of times. The more we live and the healthier life we have, the more likely it is for us to acquire both of these problems and many of them are also on the psychological range. So highlighting hypertensive diseases and metabolic disorders are very common and are also sometimes a price we pay. And why do I say this? Well, uh, major depressive disorder is associated, of, uh, you all know so well, with lifestyle factors. And they actually increase the risk of chronic conditions. We all know that MDD is associated with sometimes of being overweight, with having a more sedentary lifestyle, a volitional syndrome makes people more sedentary and less likely to move around or do physical exercise. They have comorbidity sometimes with smoking and alcohol use. And they sometimes also are adherent to treatment, actually. It's not sometimes, it's quite frequently that adherence is an issue, actually. So if we think about this, of course, they are more likely to have 
hypertension, obesity, diabetes, and metabolic syndrome, along with cardiovascular diseases. And by the way, also the treatments we prescribe sometimes make people more prone to acquire and aggravate physical illnesses by their own means. And uh, taking a closer look to cardiovascular disease, okay, all of them, heart failure, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, coronary artery disease, and myocardial infarction are quite significantly and well replicated studies have been showing this with a strong association with the higher, the, the, the severity of depression, with a longer duration of MDD, and the number of MDD episodes also brings the risk to a higher level. Um, and we cannot disregard this, and we need to refer these patients quite soon as we find this. And taking a closer look to biological uh, issues, well, in terms of diabetes type 2, we have been showing, well, research has been showing a high insulin resistance, or insulin resistant that sometimes can be actually pinned down with having an inflammatory um, status that is quite associated with chronic stress. And a nice meta-analysis has been found that uh, depression can be associated with insulin resistance, but also uh, insulin resistance can be impairing the physiological mechanisms of reward and triggering depressive symptoms. So making the high and the punchline a consistent association has been already shown between depression and diabetes. And the severity of diabetes has to be taken into consideration when we choose a treatment for these patients to tackle their MDD. What about cancer? Well, cancer has been studied for a long, long time and its correlation with MDD has been clear-cut, shown to be up to three times higher. So the prevalence of having depression when you have cancer can be three times higher than the general population. And that's across the board with many uh, cancers we diagnose every day. And cancer has been a chronic illness for many of us, thank God for that. But nevertheless, the more we diagnose, the more we, we, we must watch out for depression to develop. And a beautiful systematic review and meta-analysis by Wang in 2020, uh, and it's a, a systematic meta-analysis that has shown uh, a, a population of 280,000 breast cancer patients. I mean, here we cannot uh, overlook this. Breast cancer patients have an increased risk of having, having recurrence, all-cause mortality, and cancer-specific mortality if they have major depressive disorder. So affecting both physiological and psychological function and their quality of life, this is a single and important prognostic factor for people with cancer. And what about the considerations, knowing all this? Well, uh, recommendations and guidelines highlight how we must treat patients with comor comorbidities, physical comorbidities and depression in a collaborative care and within multidisciplinary teams. So stepped care approaches, a nice coordination between primary and secondary care, and particularly strong coordination, making patients more educated, more aware of physiological and pharmacological interventions. Any partner of this treatment plan has to be aware of this and having a tight follow-up. Of course, when we treat, and this has been said already quite clearly by the members of this panel, that efficacy is something that we need to take a close look to, but we must choose a nice tolerable medication that shows both efficacy and tolerability. And now we have many options in Cipriani's meta-analysis, and that's quite nice to know that fortioxidine is very wide, likely ranked. And fortioxetine has indeed improved MDD across a board of many symptoms, all the symptoms we need to tackle. And of course, we must highlight that new research has shown the greatest benefit to be at 20 milligrams daily. And this is quite well proportionate. So the higher you go the dose, the most likely it is for you to have a greater efficacy. And this is not at the expenses of tolerance or even side effects that we can see here quite well explained that the prevalence of adver adverse effects among antidepressants is quite striking and very well known. And we must choose the ones who have been presenting with less likelihood of presenting adverse events. Going closer to cardiovascular side effect profile. Okay. SSRIs may have an impact, particularly because they may be uh, even uh, inhibitors or, or have interactions with other medications being prescribed. We must take a good care into patients who are prescribed medications or antidepressants have an impact on the norepinephrine uh, pathway. And we must 
probably shows the ones who are less likely to have an impact on cardiovascular profile and vortioxetine comes along quite nicely. More so, it has been shown to be effective in treating patients with MDD and cardiovascular disease. So it significantly reduces the Montgomery Asperger depression rate scales in patients who are being treated with cardiovascular disease and MDD. And fortunately, this has been shown to be quite well tolerated across the range of those. Uh, having said that, not only that, but patients keep the medication throughout the treatment. And when we look into acquiring uh, problems and having more physical illnesses as people get uh, older, and being older is not something that we are looking to 80 years old, sometimes getting older is from 40 years old onwards because we start having problems to tackle, and these problems may be sometimes cardiovascular diseases and makes us more likely to have medications to prescribe for a long, long term. Then we have to watch out for QTC prolongation. And QTC prolongation has been uh, described for many medications prescribed for depression. And uh, across the board, vortioxetine has been shown to be safe. Not only that, but also patients who have many comorbidities and the, the older they are, the most likely they are, sometimes being prescribed aspirin or warfarin, well, it's nice to know that the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic profile of vortioxetine is similar to placebo here, and it's safe to be prescribed on aspirin or warfarin. But also these patients, of course, being prescribed so many medications and having a polypharmacy schedule, they are more likely to bleed. And also SSRIs, for example, is a class that has been related with increased risk of bleeding and GI bleeding. And here again, we are safe on the vortioxetine. So coming to my last slide, what about MDD and type 2 diabetes? We've been talking about metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes patients are more likely to have metabolic syndrome. They're also more, more likely to have cardiovascular diseases. So these patients need to be treated, effectively treated with, for depression without having a burden on their weight. And a nice, nice, very nice piece of research has been shown that vortioxetine and placebo have similar effects both on the short term and on the long term when you treat patients with diabetes for MDD. So I would say that we are also on the safe side when we use vortioxetine to treat patients with diabetes. And more so, it's quite well tolerated. So coming now to a very nice presentation, how can we best manage patients with MDD in older age? And I pass the word to Dr. Ismail. Great. Thank you so much, and it's really excited to present with the both of you and to an international audience. We're going to switch gears a little bit. We'll, we'll talk about comorbidities, but this time in older patients with major depressive disorder. We're going to discuss the prevalence and negative impacts of neurological comorbidities, examine guideline recommendations and considerations for the screening and treatment of MDD in older patients, and then explore some recent data, specifically the memory study, which I'll tell you about in about uh, 15 minutes. Now, the prevalence of MDD increases with advancing age, and you can see from the slide on the left, the panel on the left, that it's greatest in those who are 75 years and older and is expected to increase over time. Uh, through to 2050. So this is a public health issue as has been well described, even more so in older persons. From the panel on the left, this is a systematic review and meta-analysis where we found uh, prevalence of major depressive disorder of 14.8% in people with Alzheimer's disease. From another study on the right, they found a 40 to 50% comorbidity in Parkinson's. Now, there is a bi-directional relationship between neurological conditions and major depressive disorder such that patients with MDD are at greater risk of developing neurological conditions and those with neurological conditions are at greater risk of developing MDD. And when they are comorbid, that's associated with a decline in cognitive function as measured by the MMSC, the Mini Mental State Examination, for example, on the right. Now, our Canadian CANMAT uh, guidelines suggest we screen for major depressive disorder in patients with dementia or Parkinson's disease. And was, as was discussed early, in the context of comorbidity, the full major depressive 
disorder criteria sometimes can be misleading because of all the neurovegetative symptoms that are associated with the physical health condition. So the guidelines recommend really screening based on the two core or cardinal major depressive criteria, that being the dysphoria or depressed mood and the anhedonia or, or decreased initiative. Now, treatment considerations in the elderly as per the WFSBP guidelines are such that we should prescribe a lower dose or newer SSRIs to ensure safety, that the effect of concomitant medication on pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics is really important to consider, that there should be careful monitoring of side effects, and then very importantly to avoid antidepressants that are associated with orthostatic hypotension or sedation, both of which are associated with severe morbidity and mortality. If an older person is sedated or they have a blood pressure drop, they're more likely to fall. And when they fall, they can break a hip, which for some is fatal and, and it's a substantial burden no matter what. So we really wanna be careful in everyone, but especially in those who are older. Now, some of the latest study results on, on treatment options for older patients with MDD and comorbidities are really, really exciting. Here are data from a network meta-analysis, balancing efficacy and safety again in the way that we're used to seeing these types of studies, showing that uh, for both mirtazapine and sertraline, they outperformed placebo, balancing tolerability and had um, standardized mean differences uh, significantly greater than placebo when it came to improving depressive symptoms. But you can see there are fewer studies here, specifically in the elderly, compared to the large network meta-analyses that we've seen before. From the same network meta-analyses, you can see that for some of these agents, there was no difference between drug and placebo when it came to cognitive function, uh, again, measured by the MMSE. You can also see from the 95% confidence intervals. There, there is an imprecision in the estimates, especially with the older drugs. Probably the most precise estimate is with uh, sertraline, in which the magnitude of effect favors drug over placebo, but still not uh, within, within a confidence that, uh, that would suggest that it's better. Now, this study, which I, I think is now 11 years old, and it's, it's an important one by Katona, showed that even low dose vortioxetine improved cognitive function in reference to an active comparator, specifically duloxetine. The cognitive test was the digit symbol substitution test in which you have a code and you have to transcribe figures into another area based on that code. And it requires attention, processing speed, working memory, and executive function. So it's a really good composite cognitive test of the domains that are affected in major depressive disorder. And what we see is a clinically meaningful effect uh, based on the Cohen's D with the vortioxetine and, and not with the duloxetine, notwithstanding um, you know, uh, a difference there as well. This then leads us to the memory study. And there are two really important features about the memory study. Number one, it was conducted entirely during the pandemic, and which is just impressive overall. And, and we thank the investigators and the patients who participated in this, notwithstanding the turbulence. Half the patients went up to 20 milligrams of vortioxetine. Perhaps dosing quite low to really test the higher end of the dosing range. Now it was an open label uh, treatment study with vortioxetine in major depressive disorder, comorbid with Alzheimer's disease. What that means major depressive disorder onset, and this is important because if you have a tight link and tangle, which symptoms are secondary to neurodegenerative disease. So in this case, it's clear that these are major uh, depressive episodes and that required treatment. And there were a number of outcome measures. The primary one was efficacy, which is a, a Montgomery Asperg depression rating scale reduction, but also cognition, 
quality of life function. And what we see is that, first of all, on the left, that the mean change in the madras was improving throughout the study and significantly so. And again, these are, these are across the dosing range of, of, of the drug. So 36% almost of patients showed a response with at least a 50% reduction of madras by week 12. We see the CGIS and by By definition, a one-point clinically meaningful improvement. There was a meaningful improvement in the digit symbol subs and the number of correct transcriptions and increasing throughout the C memory data with the Ray Volt auditory learning test showing that both short and delayed recall in daily functioning improved throughout the course of the study starting at week one and progressively increasing over the 12 weeks of the study which were correlated with improvements in health-related quality of life. All again, consistent with a market improvement across multiple domains, primary and secondary outcome measures. When it came to safety, most of the adverse events were GI-related, consistent with our experience of this drug. There were no new safety signals uh, alerting us to, to, to potentially prescribe more cautiously than we might. 51.4% of patients remained on the 20 milligrams a day uh, until study at week 12. Now, what we see is that in patients with major depressive disorder and comorbid AD, there were significant long-term improvements in depressive and cognitive symptoms throughout the dosing range of bordioxetine. The five milligrams that we might be used to prescribing all the way out to the 20 milligrams that uh, was promoted in the study design here. Uh, that improvement then continued based on a six month surveillance post-marketing study um, out at week eight, out at week 24 thereafter, continuing to show improvements both subjectively in terms of cognitive symptoms and also objectively in terms of major depressive burden with again, no new safety signals. So in summary, what this tells us is that in people with major depressive disorder and comorbid Alzheimer's disease, that we have trial data to suggest that a clinically meaningful improvement in both depressive symptoms as primary and cognitive symptoms, including function and health-related quality of life can improve, which to me are pretty exciting data. And with that, then we'll go back to the group and answer questions from the audience. Well, thank you, Dr. Ismail. Thank you, Dr. Almeida, for the wonderful presentations. Uh, as I said in the beginning, I've known both of you for years. I think I speak for myself and for the whole audience uh, to say thank you. I always learn something new when I interact with both of you. Uh, and with that, let's move to some audience uh, Q&A. Uh, let me start with uh, Dr. Ismail, uh, direct this question to you. Would you recommend 20 milligrams of vortioxetine in your patients who have both major depression and dementia? Yes, I would. It's all subject to tolerability though. And what's important here is that if we start too high, if we're too aggressive to get to the 20, then in my experience, it's the GI symptoms that will limit us. So I will still start at five, but we don't want to languish at five, knowing that, um, that we can get greater efficacy potentially at higher doses and, and that the five milligrams is, is a modest dose. And it, again, early in the life cycle of this, this drug, studies in specific groups showed that five milligrams might have been helpful, but that, that didn't necessarily generalize to the larger population. So I do push it out to 20. My 
my modal dose is, uh, it, it may, it's probably 10 and 15, pro probably my modal dose is 15, but um, I'm, not, I'm not afraid to push it out to 20 as, as with this study and uh, showing that it was well tolerated. Yeah, it's, it's great to hear that feedback from you, especially that you work with these populations. And I, I agree, in the early days of vortioxetine, uh, with the older population, we would start with uh, 5 milligrams and maybe keep it there or 10. Uh, but even in my practice, uh, I've noticed that going to that 20 milligram dose does seem to make a difference. Uh, Dr. Uh, Almeida, let me uh, direct this question to you. So uh, the question is, about 30% of patients uh, with dementia have depression um, or depressive symptoms. Should the depression be treated or should we wait for the optimal response of combination therapy to kick in? And I think here they mean combination therapy uh, for the Alzheimer's. I'll ask you because I think we all deal with uh, these patients and then I'll come back to Dr. Ismail um, maybe to comments uh, from research data. Well, it's a, a great question, but as you, we all know, patients come to us uh, in jeopardy and in trouble, and they suffer. Even if they are not quite able to communicate the symptoms, they are in trouble, and families are quite concerned. We could not, I guess, uh, in terms of clinical practice, day-to-day -day responsibility, we couldn't wait for the, the, um, patient, the medications used for dementia treatment to kick in. I think if we have a presentation, even a prodromal presentation with severe depression, we have to treat. And sometimes, I, I must be quite clear, I use as much as possible monotherapy, an antidepressant that makes me on the safe side of and on the efficacious side uh, quite comfortable. So I would not wait, I would treat, unless it's not something that is relevant. But we are talking about MDD here, so if it's relevant, we must treat. And I think that speaks to your presentation as well, because these same patients that have uh, any form of dementia will often also have diabetes or cardiovascular conditions. So choosing a medication that's safe, that you don't have to be monitoring or worrying about, uh, makes a big difference. Dr. Ismail, from a research perspective uh, or guideline perspective or your clinical perspective, what do you think? Do we wait for the optimization of combination therapy for Alzheimer's or do we start an antidepressant when they have depression? I think it's important to start the antidepressant when they present with depressive symptoms, notwithstanding if they are on a cholinesterase inhibitor or not. We know the cholinesterase inhibitors work, um, although, although they are used less often than they used to be. What I very commonly see in my practice is that when cholinase, cholinesterase inhibitors are deprescribed, um, that I will see an emergence of behavioral symptoms at about six weeks and, and get a consult almost like clockwork. And, and this is an underappreciated aspect of those drugs. There are cholinergic mechanisms in behavior. However, in Alzheimer's, there are also serotonergic and noradrenergic mechanisms that contribute to symptomatology. And when you have a multimodal type of antidepressant that affects you know, uh, the, the serotonergic pathways and, and noradrenergic pathways as, as well as cholinergic and dopaminergic, then we have a better chance at normalizing function to a certain extent to improve symptoms first and foremost, but then cognition, behavior, quality of life, um, and, and, and function thereafter. So to me, it's very common that persons with Alzheimer's will be on cholinesterase inhibitors and certain energy agents. In fact, we have recently analyzed some data that we'll see uh, published later this year that showed that antidepressants are far more commonly prescribed in persons with dementia and with Alzheimer's specifically than are Alzheimer's drugs. Yeah, indeed, a very challenging uh, disease, a very challenging patient uh, population. And I agree with both of you. I think uh, in my patients, I don't wait, I do start the antidepressant, and I often uh, more lately choose vortioxetine because I don't have to worry about hyponatremia, I don't have to worry about uh, QTC prolongation, uh, bleeding in these complex patients. And as you said, Dr. Ismail, the, the complex pharmacology of uh, uh, vortioxetine can be used to our advantage. The blockade of the serotonin 7 receptor, the upregulation of acetylcholine signaling can benefit our patients. Uh, a reminder to our audience, you can continue to submit your questions through the platform and we'll try to get as, to as many of them as we can. Next question here is, many people who live with diabetes have impaired cognition. Uh, 
We see that in our clinical practice. We see that in studies. Do you see a benefit of using Brintelex vortioxetine in patients with depression and diabetes who have cognitive symptoms? Let me direct that to you, Dr. Almeida. You spoke about uh, diabetes. What do you think? Yeah, it's it's quite common, and uh, in my clinical practice, I'm 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 being quite clear. I'm talking about my clinical practice. I do choose, and I've been choosing for a long time. Patients who have somatic comorbidities that needs to to be or at least alleviated in their cognitive symptoms. And it's not only diabetes. All the metabolic syndrome range, of course, because they have cardiovascular and cerebrovascular burden, I do prefer, I opt for vortioxetine. For example, even in cancer patients to, who present with chemo brain and have also MDD, I also go first for vortioxetine, not only because it doesn't have interactions with inhibitors of uh, for, for cytochrome 450 isoenzymes, and many patients are on tamoxifen, for example, for breast cancer, and that we cannot prescribe an inhibitor of 2D6, and for that reason, also, I prefer vortioxetine, and that's quite clear-cut, because the improvement of the, of the cognitive symptoms is quite striking. I would definitely go for it. And uh, again, it's my clinical practice uh, mainstay. It's been for quite a long time now, and it's been a uh, preference uh, for, for quite some time. I, I think these are issues that are very important to think about. Diabetes is a global public health problem, and studies have shown that about one-third of diabetic patients will develop depression at some point in their lives. So I think uh, all clinicians of all walks of life, family doctors or internists, uh, endocrinologists, psychiatrists need to be thinking about this aspect with diabetes. Uh, next question, what's your opinion per, about considering uh, depression? Oh, yeah, so please, Dr. Ismail, if you want to uh, yeah, chime in on the I previous just, question. Just, if, you don't, if you don't mind, there are also really strong of links course. between diabetes and, Alz and, and Alzheimer's disease, and um, not to be underappreciated. So if uh, a, a, a patient has comorbid depression and diabetes, and the di diabetes is poorly controlled, in part due to the major depression, treating that successfully could result in better uh, glucose regulation and then perhaps less risk of, of emergent Alzheimer's disease. And it's not just vascular dementia. There are actually amyloid links with, with diabetes. So it's, um, it's complex, but you know, suffice it to say, very important to treat all of the comorbidities. Yeah, I strongly agree with you. And in, in, in addition to that, the neuroinflammatory pathways, the neurometabolic pathways, I think all of those are important to consider. Let me take one last question here and uh, maybe start with Dr. Almeida, but direct it to all of us. Maybe uh, if Dr. Ismail, you could uh, chime in and myself as well, because you know, in, in Toronto, we did work across from a major cancer hospital uh, in Toronto. Um, and Dr. Almeida, you work with cancer patients all the time. So what's your opinion about considering major depressive disorder as a risk factor for some types of cancer, for example, gastric cancer. For many times we've been seeing the epidemiological relationship. Uh, I mean, it's quite uh, well known for all of us that have been into medical school that, uh, for example, pancreatic cancer could be presenting first and all with depression before having even the generalized symptoms of low weight, low, low weight and f so forth and so on. So I would say that it's quite uh, common. It's quite common and sometimes the, the patients are not being referred as soon as they should be because people rely that patients who have been suffering with cancer, they are expected to be presenting with some depressive symptoms and more sooner than later, actually, they would develop a full-blown range uh, MDD. So I would say that it's quite common. It's quite well uh, studied. It's quite relevant, up to three times more prevalent and it's across the board of cancers. And actually, it's not only MDD that is quite important. In cancer patients, the suicidal risk is also quite important. I have not time to emphasize all this, but the suicidal risk is increased amongst patients with gastric cancer, upper hyaluronic cancer, head and neck cancer, lung cancer, and so forth and so on. So please be well aware. If you have a patient who has been treated or is a survival of cancer, for example, prostate cancer survivors also have an increased risk, please if you are in doubt, refer, and we'll manage to make a differential diagnosis and treat if the depression needs to be treated. Uh, Dr. Esmail, can I get a quick take from you, maybe from a clinical perspective? Sure, I, I tend to see the cancer patients after they've been treated and um, often in the context of chemo brain that's been mentioned. Uh, 
And the trajectory usually is that there's an acute change in cognition after the chemotherapy, and then kind of a resolution to baseline or close to baseline, and then a gradual decline thereafter. And it's during that decline that they get referred to neurology clinic, and, and, and we assess them. Um, and, and major depression is, is often comorbid at that stage, requiring treatment. Thank you both for the Q&A, and we'll come back to you in a bit. Uh, for now, let's move ahead. And a reminder to our audience, please continue to submit your Q&A. I know people are joining the webinar all the time, so you can do that through the platform. Now we'll move on to a presentation around substance use. This is a major comorbidity in depression, really a major comorbidity in all of our mental health conditions, but really important to talk about in the context of depression. Learning objectives, very quickly, are to look at the prevalence of the comorbidity of MDD and substance use disorders, but also to look at what are some treatment considerations, also reviewing some very new data on this with regards to vortioxetine. Now, how common are substance use disorders in patients who have depression? The answer is they're very common. About 25% of patients, a quarter of our patients, one in every four patients that's walking into your clinic with depression will have some form of substance use disorder. The commonest being alcohol, so that's happening in about one in every five patients. Other drugs such as cannabis and stimulant use are very common. And the pattern is very clear that males tend to have higher rates of substance use, especially alcohol, especially single, younger, or divorced males. Uh, and uh, epidemiological data also shows that it may be males not of Hispanic origin. So what is the consequence of all of this? It's really important to identify substance use in the course of depression because there's a huge negative impact. From the famous STAR-D data, we have an analysis looking at patients who had substance use disorders. Remember, STAR-D was a, a naturalistic trial, multi-centered, looking at real-world treatment of depression in multiple centers across the United States. And we see in, these, in this analysis of the STAR-D data that patients who had substance use disorders also had an earlier onset of depression, they had a longer total duration of illness, they had more frequently anxiety disorders, and we established earlier, and we'll talk about later, that anxiety disorders worsen the course and the outcome of the treatment of depression. These patients have increased suicidal ideation and increased suicidal uh, attempts, and as a whole, this increases depressive symptomatology and worsens functional outcome. Why did I say that it's important to look at? Because across the globe, there's a gap between what we as healthcare providers see and what's actually happening with patients. So this study shows that in a survey of both patients and healthcare providers, you see that the rate of the substance use disorder is twice what was assessed by the doctor. So if we look at that overall, if we look at that in the acute stage of depression, and even when the depression is better in the remission stage, it's almost double or more the number of patients that are actually using substances or having substance misuse uh, or a substance disorder when they have depression compared to what the healthcare provider assessed. What are the recommendations from the guidelines? Well, the World Federation of Societies of Biological Psychiatry recommend that when we have a patient with depression and a substance use disorder at the same time, that it's important to treat both conditions simultaneously because treating the depression and the substance use disorder at the same time with biological and psychotherapeutic approaches improves both at the same time. So we really have to work in parallel with these two comorbidities. If the substance use disorder uh, exists in the presence of a severe depression, it's sometimes useful, according to these guidelines, to start with the substance use treatment first before an antidepressant. But overall, it's important to be looking at pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic interactions. These happen not only with alcohol, but often happen with tobacco and other illicit substances. In general, the guidelines recommend starting with SSRIs, but we'll talk about that in more detail later on. Um, and uh, other um, you know, uh, antidepressants with mechanisms of action that are more novel have been looked at, but there's insufficient data, according to this guideline, to recommend one type of antidepressant over another. Some interesting new data around vortioxetine. Well, in this retrospective observational study of vortioxetine in patients who had depression and substance use disorder, looking at the past six months of treatment, you see in these patients, and remember we said these patients, depression is harder to treat 
you see that the rate of uh, improvement of depression is quite good over six months, and this translated into a functional outcome when we look at a scale like the Sheehan Disability Inventory. Impressively, you see as their depression is improving over this six months, the rate of substance use is dropping. And this has been shown for alcohol, for cannabis, and for cocaine, uh, very uh, statistically and clinically significantly, and you see the curve there coming down over time over the six months of treatment. Let me wrap up this part uh, with looking at another study. This is a 12-month naturalistic study looking at the effects of vortioxetine flexibly dosed from 5 to 20 milligrams a day versus other antidepressants in the treatment of comorbid substance use disorder and a major depressive episode. What we see in this uh, uh, study is that there are symptom reductions in the depression scores, in the generalized psychopathology, in the suicide risks. Remember, we said this is a big problem in this patient population, but also in their craving for substances. Impressively, we see higher remission and response rates of vortioxetine compared to other antidepressants. 56% of patients responded compared to 36% of other antidepressants, and a huge gap when it comes to remission. 40%, 47 excuse me, percent of patients on vortioxetine remitted compared to 12% with other antidepressants. And in general, there are no new safety concerns emerging in this trial. In fact, most patients did not have major side effects. Nausea was the most common side effect leading to withdrawal from the trial, and in most cases it was transient and improved over time. Also, it's important to note that there was no major interaction in the study between ethanol consumption and vortioxetine in terms of psychomotor performance. Let me move on, if I can, and talk about COVID-19. It's almost four years since the beginning of the pandemic. In December of this year, we'll reach four years since the start of the pandemic, and we still see the effects of this pandemic in many areas of society, economics, and medicine. The learning objectives for this presentation is to look at the increasing prevalence of MDD as a result of the pandemic. We look at the mental health uh, complications seen in COVID-19 survivors, especially on cognitive performance, and we'll also look at interesting new data around vortioxetine in this patient population. So the COVID-19 pandemic was a global crisis, and along with this global crisis compared to previous pandemics or previous economic crises that were global, you see an increase in the rates of depression across the globe. This data has been replicated in a multitude of countries and the COVID-19 pandemic in general has been estimated to increase the cases of depression by 53 million or so in 2020, an increase of almost 30%. And this had wide ranging impact on patients all across the globe. So a review of 14 meta-analyses showed that about 30% increase of depression after and during a SARS-CoV, uh, excuse me, a COVID infection Patients who had a pre-existing mental condition had a deterioration in their mental functioning and sometimes had relapses. Some of the common symptoms that occur in depression also occur in COVID, and this may lead to a negative synergistic effect. So issues like fatigue, poor sleep, concentration problems, and indeed in survivors, issues like cognitive impairment uh, may persist. And healthcare systems, while they were overwhelmed in the pandemic, we may, in fact, over the next uh, few years, and what we're seeing now is a parallel pandemic of a mental health crisis emerging after COVID. This impressive study of almost 85,000 COVID survivors shows clearly that when you test these patients with cognitive testing, you see that they don't perform at their expected age or demographic profile. Another systematic review showed that the prevalence of cognitive impairment in hospitalized COVID-19 patients can reach up to almost two-thirds uh, of patients. And what are some of the cognitive impairments that we see in this patient population? Well, we see short-term memory problems, attention problems, concentration problems, all issues that affect a human being's functioning, especially in the 21st century. So in order to return our patients to their previous level of functioning, we have to be mindful of some of these cognitive dysfunctions that happen both with depression and increased with the COVID-19 crisis. Let me show you some impressive data on vortioxetine in this patient population. So this was a study using flexibly dosed 5 to 20 milligrams a day of vortioxetine in patients 
who have a depression following a COVID-19 infection. And what you see over the course of the study that uh, the depressive symptoms are improving compared to the baseline and cognitive performance is improving over time uh, as measured by the DSST, which Dr. Ismail spoke about earlier, but also about uh, when it comes to the patient's perception of their own cognitive impairment as measured by the PDQ. Also across the board, we mentioned that symptoms of anxiety, anhedonia, sleep, fatigue are problems. And across the board in this study, you see improvements in a multitude of these aspects. So the HAM-A is improving, the sleep quality index is improving, and the SHAPS, which is a measure of anhedonia, is improving. And altogether, this is leading to an improved quality of life in these patients. So with that, I will hand over to my colleague, Dr. Susanna Almeida again, who will uh, wrap up and take us home with a presentation on one of the most important psychiatric comorbidities, MDD with anxiety, and we'll come back to a panel discussion after that. Dr. Almeida. Thank you again, Dr. Al-Suaidan. It's been a very nice uh, afternoon for me here in Portugal, for you other time zones, uh, different times again. But how can we you know, go further in terms of our knowledge when we treat patients with MDD and anxiety? So learning those activities, you already know to read the prevalence, discuss the treatment considerations, and to know what new data of artioxidine studies have been shown in this uh, strikingly challenging population. And what's the prevalence and the impact? Well, since Kessler's WHO massive study, uh, it was an epidemiological study going across 70,000 patients that were adults, being diagnosed in the previous 12 months with MDD had an increased odds up to half the patients had presenting or would be presenting a lifetime anxiety disorder. So it's been quite remarkable and this connection has been established for quite some time now. And what about uh, any other anxiety disorder when you have an MDD? Well, if you have MDD, you have an increased risk up to 12 times uh, to have a GAD. So it's quite important. And uh, this is numbers that have been replicated throughout the years. But not only so, but anxiety is a symptom that comes in on and on and on. And uh, the more uh, severe the, the depression, the more likely it is for it to be presenting. And it's something that comes acutely, but also on the medium and long term. So anxiety is a symptom that is not only quite common, but lingers and it's strikingly com commonly difficult to treat. What about the dimensions that we know that are effective, uh, affected when a patient presents with MDD and anxiety? Well, they have increased severity of symptoms. We know that and it's quite difficult to keep them on the remission range. They have lower quality of life and of course, anxiety brings us all to being quite a shout of higher suicide risk. The study has shown, well, you all know these numbers and these graphs, but to remind you, if you have a patient with anxiety symptoms and MDD, they will take longer to relapse and they will be more, more likely to recur. So the ones that do not have will have a fortunate uh, course that is more protected in terms of uh, remission and response. And well, the guidelines are quite old. Unfortunately, uh, all these data have not been translated into more re recent and up-to-date guidelines. And we all know that the primary disorder, either MDD or, G or any anxiety disorder, has to be treated first. We usually treat them together in clinical practice. But uh, for example, the World Federation of Societies of Biological Psychiatry guidelines are already 10 years old. As Dr. Uh, um, Ismail just said, start low, go slow, but at least at, at achieve the highest, if it, if the most efficacious dose range. And well, what do we know about samples and uh, what do we know about clinical day-to-day -day common patients that we treat in our clinical practices every day? Well, two very nice studies. The relief uh, study was performed in, a, in clinical practice, everyday patients treated with vortioxetine either in primary care or in secondary care across the range of uh, the usually prescribed uh, doses of vortioxetine. And we've seen in this uh, sample analysis that patients who had MDD and comorbid GAD performed better when treated with vortioxetine in three important ranges of, of aspects. Well, in terms of their functioning, and they were kept improving uh, as time went by. So they kept on under treatment and the functioning increased 
as the treatment went on from 12 weeks to 24 weeks, the PUHQ that measures the depressive symptoms severity also improved across time and actually it's quite nice to know that we carry on in seeing an improvement from tw week, tw week 12 to week 24 and more that that we see that clinical important meaningful change in the, G, uh, in the CGIS uh, monitoring. But well this is uh, data that had to be further seen and watched and the most important study I would say is this one because this study looked into severe patients with MDD and severe comorbid GAD so they are day-to-day -day, everyday clinical um, practice patients they were uh, assessed up to a number of 100 and they were taken off their usual medications to treat both MDD and GAD and they were put on vortioxetine and quite uh, daringly they were because they were pushed into 20 milligrams in one week. I should say that all medications were switched or stopped and only the ones that were stable on benzodiazepines were kept on benzodiazepines and this sample is quite important because only six patients were under benzodiazepines throughout the study. So four on alprazolam and one on diazepam throughout the study. All others were not taking any other medication except vortioxetine. And what have we seen? Well, we've seen that the depression went down. The Montgomery Asperger rating scale, that is the one that we find more helpful in clinical practice to be accurate, has shown an increase in severity of depression, but also the Hamilton anxiety scale went quite below the, the, the um, uh, significantly timely aspect of being treated effic efficaciously the patients with GAD. So let's put it into perspective. 94 of patients increased the dose of ortioxetine up to 20 milligram. That shows that it's quite tolerable and the tolerability is quite important in these patients. And 87% of those patients, 87 in 100, maintained this higher dose throughout the study period. Well, we have compliance issues. We all know that we have compliance issues in patients with MDD, but also in patients with MDD and GAD or other uh, anxiety uh, disorders. And having these patients under treatment at week 24 is quite striking. To be clear, only 77% of patients had partial response when they entered this study. So they actually benefit quite a lot for entering this study and the results are quite relevant and important for our day-to-day cl -day clinical practice. So, coming to the dimensions of can becoming better, well, we have severe MDD and comorbid GAD and vortioxetine between 10 to, to, to 20 milligram, particularly the 20 milligram range, significantly improved overall functioning. So we have functioning in all these dimensions that go from day-to-day -day function, occupational functioning, cognitive function, even social functioning. We want patients to go back to their lives, taking care of their lives, being able to be with their loved ones and having leisure time. So all these domains went better, but also their quality of life, assessed by their own means, by their own view, went on the better side of life. So they got better. And this is something that we look forward when we start treating a patient. Thank you so much. I hand over to Dr. Alsbiden. Well, thank you for that fantastic. Yeah, thank you for that fantastic uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Almeida. Uh, it's great to bring both of you back, and maybe we'll talk a, a bit about uh, the last three topics. Uh, let me direct a question, if I can, to both of you. So we talked about substance use disor disorder, comorbidity. We talked about COVID-19. We talked about anxiety. We all know from our training that many of the classical guidelines say to start with an SSRI or SNRI when it comes to treating depression. Many new guidelines mention a number of other compounds, including with novel mechanisms, such as vortioxetine. How does the data that we looked at throughout these presentations translate into your clinical practice? Has it actually changed what you choose as first line for many of your patients with substance use after the COVID-19 crisis and indeed many of the patients who have anxiety disorders? Let me start with Dr. Ismail. Sure. Um, first of all, the, the data just presented by Dr. Almeida are very welcome. Early on, we didn't have good data about treatment of anxiety uh, comorbid with major depression with, with vortioxetine, and we were left guessing a little bit. Um, our clinical practices have told us, yes, it does behave um, you know, like other SSRIs and SNRIs in terms of treatment of anxiety, but the data are, are 
are really welcome and, and help inform us. For my practice specifically, I, cognition is, is top of mind uh, because I, I, I see, you know, see people with, with uh, subjective cognitive complaints or mild cognitive impairment or those who have, have dementia, syndromic dementia proper. And, and so anything I prescribe, I have to view through a lens of cognition. Um, and therefore, vodioxetine has a special place because of the, the data that, that show its pro-cognitive effect relative to uh, duloxetine in the old Katona study and um, that clinically meaningful effect in the memory study. So to me, that bodes really well for really supporting what I'm already doing, that the data also, uh, also show that. So I'll, I'll hand off then to, to Susanna. Then. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Almeida, what do you think? You see a diverse patient population, cancer patients, uh, you know, young patients, older patients. How has the recent data affected your first line choices? Well, we have to take into consideration not only the needs of each patient we treat, and the needs are quite striking. I mean, many patients present to us in a uh, uh, clinical uh, trial manner. So they present with comorbidities and they present with sometimes psychological, psychiatric comorbidities. So I guess if we have this uh, difficult uh, thing that we all know beforehand that is compliance, we must choose. We have sometimes one, 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 one opportunity to do well. We have one chance to do well first time. So I guess choosing the most efficacious and the best tolerable medication is always something I look forward to. Having said that, maybe uh, guidelines have to be balanced because they, they take into consideration also the costs. But never having said that, I guess the cost of having a relapse, a uh, precocious relapse, uh, or having a recurrent illness that needs to be admitted, to, uh, patients need to admin, be admitted to a ward, or need to carry on having a uh, less functional life, we're not able to get a job. I think that's something that we need to look at much more than the cost of the treatment sometimes we prescribe. So overall, uh, we treat patients and we need to find the best response for that particular patient. Yeah, I 100% agree. I think the points both of you raised are really important. And that last point, Susanna, about cost. Uh, cost is not just upfront cost. There's indirect cost. And as you said, the cost of a relapse has a huge effect on the patient, on the family, on society, but also on health economics. And uh, one of the highest causes of relapse is a patient stopping their medication because of side effects. I think the Cipriani meta-analysis that was shown earlier is really important to have a medication that is both very effective but highly tolerable and improving multiple aspects of depression including cognition as Dr. Ismail said is really important to look at because you may get the patient better, keep the patient better and they're willing to stay on that medication uh, long term. Now coming to anxiety, I would say in my practice patients who have depression, anxiety is almost the rule rather than the exception. Whether we're talking depression with anxious distress or depression with a comorbid anxiety condition. Um, and I, I've tried a number of different antidepressants in these patients, and I've been impressed recently with the performance of vortioxetine. But let me, let me ask both of you, how often do you see anxiety in your practice, and how uh, have different uh, treatment approaches um, performed in your hands, whether biological or non-biological, when it comes to depression with anxiety? Let me start with Dr. Elmeyed at this time. I agree with you. I see most patients that have more anxiety as a comorbidity as a, or as a symptom or, or not. Sometimes even if it's not noticeable, they, they, they describe this feeling of inner tension. And even if uh, their relatives or other, other patients uh, around or other uh, physicians around then don't notice the anxiety, it's there. So I, I guess the most important message here is we have to be clear and safe. And it's very easy to over-prescribe and uh, prescribe complex schedules for patients with anxiety and, and MDD. So I would say if we have a, a chance of having a simple medication that is able to put patients into uh, long-term compliance, I mean, that's the best. Uh, just remi reminding you, the data from the studies I presented, patients on six months treatment still were compliant and were, and were doing well. And I guess that's what we all want, doing well and being in the long term compliant with the treatment. That's the best way to treat patients, I guess. Fantastic. Dr. Ismail, uh, we'll take uh, your take on this and then maybe we'll take a few audience questions. 
Sure, I would concur with Dr. Almeida. First of all, in in younger, you know, you know, um, general adult population, I would. I would say anxiety is almost ubiquitous when it comes to comorbidity with depression. I, I, I would estimate 85 to 90 percent of people with, uh, um, with depression have comorbid anxiety. And, and again, it complicates treatment, so we have to be really thoughtful about addressing it. In the older population, that anxiety is also very, very common, and it's, and it's more profound in terms of its impact and, uh, on, on persons with dementia. Um, you know, there are cholinergic mechanisms as well with that, that dementia-related anxiety. So it's, it's, it's really deep and, and meaningful and very, very important to address concurrent with the depression because um, in, in, with, with the co-presentation of anxiety and depression, there is such a great degree of dysfunction um, that, that their quality of life is, is really poor. So it's important to address them with the a priori goals of, of at least a reduction, but ideally a remission of, of those symptoms. And can uh, I just add so something? One question. Uh, yes, please, please. Sorry, because I was just uh, listening to Dr. Ismail and uh, I reminded myself. For example, if you are taking care of someone who is presenting with depression and anxiety and they start uh, becoming better and they discuss the need of carrying on taking medication, well, again, tolerability and side effects is, is quite important to tackle. The, uh, listening to the younger generation, I mean, se sexual side effects, uh, other tolerability issues like weight gain is something that is quite striking uh, and patients sometimes drop medications because they acquire the side effects and they, they don't confide anymore to us that they are not taking medications. So I guess bearing that in mind, the long term actually is quite helpful to look at to a medication that doesn't bring these issues as we treat patients. Thank you for that input. So let me take one final question. Uh, the data presented on this uh, increase from 10 to 20 milligrams after the first week and the data you showed Dr. Almeida about 87, 94% of patients were increased to 20 milligrams after one week and 87% actually stayed at that dose throughout the study. It's quite impressive in terms of tolerability. So my question to both of you and I'll give you my clinical take as well, is that something you do in your practice uh, with some of your patients? Maybe not the, the elderly patients but uh, let's say adult patients under 65, is that something you do and how has that worked in your hands? Let me start with Dr. Ismail. Yeah, it really depends on their tolerability to that first initial dosing. And um, I tend not to go right to 10. I really do start at five, but um, briefly, sometimes just for a matter of days to get up to uh, you know 10 and then to 15, again, where I, where I then decide, um, you know, am I going to go to 20? Am I going to stay at 15? Again, that's in the, it's in the under 65 population. Um, but uh, it, it, it just, if, I, if, I, if I'm too aggressive with it, then I, then I worry again, it's the GI side effects that are, that are rate limiting. So I like to take a, a little bit of time to titrate up, um, notwithstanding the fact that the data show that many people did tolerate that more, um, kind of assertive dosing regimen or schedule. Dr. Amelia, what do you think clinically? What have you done? Most times I've done differently because I didn't have the data that we now have. So I would be more cautious on the titration regime. I would sometimes take the 5, 10, 20 milligram uh, increase in up to a three, three week range. Uh, just checking if the nausea were a problem or not a problem. When it's not a problem, I titrate quite fast. And it's quite nice to, I mean, it all, always depends on the severity of the depression you're treating. The more severe the depression and comorbid anxiety problems, the, sh the more you should be prone to go up the dose. Always watching, always watching the side effects. But again, it's only the nausea that can be difficult. And if it's not referred, you go up, I go up in a faster way. Right, uh, so let me be the naysayer here and uh, I'll say for a while I've been taking uh, a more assertive approach starting my patients at 10 milligrams and going to 20 after one week. There is some data showing that the nausea differences between the doses, 5, 10, 15 and 20 are very minimal um, and I would say in my clinical practice um, I, I've seen it work for many patients. 
uh, especially in patients who don't tell me they have a prior sensitivity uh, to nausea. So I think there's a multitude of different approaches. It's nice that we have uh, clinical data coming out uh, pointing to this. Let me take one final question for the sake of time and then wrap up. So the question says, for patients with comorbidities who take a lot of drugs, a lot of uh, medications uh, who, uh, themselves, how do we maintain the long-term management of these patients and persuade them to, insi uh, if, to, to insist on taking drugs? So I, I guess what the, the question is saying here is, how do we make sure that a patient is adherent and compliant, especially in the presence of polypharmacy? Uh, let me start with Dr. Almeida. Well, I, I've been saying this from the beginning. I have a very collaborative approach, uh, and I always ask what's the patient's objectives to achieve. And if I can go after them, and I always explain that we are trying to make them well, f fully functioning, and uh, not recurring for uh, the time possible. So having that, bearing that in mind, I'm always asking uh, when they come again for the clinic, for the follow-up appointments, if they are doing well, if they are, have any complaints about treatment compliance. And sometimes I, I, I always ask, well, it's difficult to take a medication if you don't feel the need to take it anymore because you're doing so well. Do you find it difficult to take it? And most patients sometimes they say, well, actually, I, I don't mind taking it because I don't notice I'm taking it, but I feel so well that I won't go back to uh, having a recovery. So I guess psychoeducation, uh, being that thorough in terms of explaining the hazards of a, uh, an early recurrence or having a recurrent disease makes everything easier, I guess, to make patient, patients to comply. But bearing in mind that if they complain about the side effect, we need to address it. We cannot insist on something because they will, they will drop the medication. And that's no, no, no doubt about it. Dr. Ismail, a very quick take in uh, this patient population. Yes. I would concur entirely. Um, a priori, I discuss with patients that my goals, my primary outcome measures, are full functional recovery and resolution of any cognitive symptoms, and that improvement of depressive symptoms are a step along that way. If our target is only reduction of depressive symptoms, even remission of depressive symptoms, but we don't ag address cognition and function, they may stop the medications. If they're too groggy at work, if they're still not you know, they're well enough to be out of hospital or seeing me less often, but not well enough to integrate, then that's not necessarily a win. And, and so up front, we say, this is what we want, full functional recovery and, and, and normalization of cognition. And then that informs our discussion of the choices that we make and how we measure it along the way. And as per Dr. Almeida, that's a collaborative approach with them invested in the outcome. And I think that promotes um, adherence. Fantastic. Well, with that, I'd like to thank both of you for your input, for your knowledge, and for sharing your knowledge so generously. Dr. Suzanne Almeida, Dr. Zahnur Ismail, on behalf of the audience, I thank you so much uh, for your time. Uh, and I'd like to leave the audience with some closing remarks. First of all, uh, thanks again for attending. I think uh, all of you are busy clinicians taking time out of your busy practice to attend this webinar. Hopefully, we provided you with information that helps academically, that helps clinically. I'd also like to thank Lundbeck for their investment in the education and research around brain disorders, specifically in this case, mental health across the globe. I will leave you with some abbreviated uh, prescribing information around vortioxetine. Please refer to your local uh, approvals and abbreviated product information. And just as a reminder, uh, please fill in the survey. This helps us make future webinars even better and more adapted to your needs. On behalf of the panel and on behalf of Lundbeck, I thank you once again and have a good rest of your day.